Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, one of our teammates is having difficulties with her uh, computer uh, live stream, but in the name of Jesus, we're going to get it together. She'll be able to get back on. We are saying start with this song. We're praying that everybody is well. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender all to him, I freely give, I will ever love and trust him in his present daily life. I surrender all, I surrender all. Yes, amen, 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 amen. Let us know for our scripture reading this morning. It will be coming from John, the 15th chapter, and I will read verses 1 through 14. And it reads as thus, I am the, vine, the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are cleansed, I see you now, uh, oh. through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of, its, of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit. Uh, for without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my word abide in you, Ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein, herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken unto you that ye might joy, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy be full. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man but lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Amen. Shall we pray? This morning, our kind Heavenly Father, it's once again that we have come before and to your house of worship. Father, we come to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, we just say thank you for allowing us to come before your throne of grace. We come to say, Lord, we love you, we praise you, we worship, and we adore you. And Father, we ask that you continue to bless each and every one of us individually, then bless us collectively, and keep your arms and blessings upon this church and every church that is open in your name this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another lesson. It's coming out of 2 Timothy, the first chapter, and we will be talking from verses 3 through 14. And it is the title of the lesson is Called with the Holy Calling. And a subtopic could be Trust and Encouragement 
which we'll see in as we go throughout the lesson and this lesson. Uh, so we'll continue in our look in our lesson study for this quarter. As this, this unit, this lesson today is, Paul is providing encouragement as he and Timothy, or as, well, let me say that again. Paul, as we go through this lesson, we'll see that Paul is providing encouragement to Timothy. Timothy was one of his protege uh, in the ministry. He come up on the Paul and he had formed a, a bond with Paul because Paul was a, a renowned apostle, preacher, uh, and established in churches throughout Asia Minor. And the setting here, Paul is writing to the young Timothy from a Roman prison that he had been in prison for preaching and teaching Christ. And I said, uh, as being an evangelist, the young Timothy had formed a relationship with Paul and they had traveled together. And so Paul, Timothy had gone back to for his church and he had been called to be the pastor of that church. And Paul is writing in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, is Paul's uh, pastoral letters to the young Timothy. He was encouraging him to stay true to his faith. Do not uh, give in, uh, do not stray from teaching the truth of God's word, okay? Now, so Paul was telling him, even to told him about he knew about his his biblical DNA, because he was brought up in a Christian home. His mother, Eunice, and his grandmother, they were all uh, Christian women. And Timothy being uh, brought up in that home, he had Christian values. And he was telling him not to stray from those Christian values. And then another point I really want to make here is about friendship and a relationship, the two of them had formed a bond uh, to Paul and Timothy that was based on brotherly love, faith, and trust in one another. So that's the principle for most friendships or, that last, okay? And then Paul's Timothy being showing his Christian upbringing and is being committed to traveling with Paul and being his helper, then uh, Paul well, had found in Timothy that he could uh, turn the reins over to Timothy as to further evangelize and be true to his preaching. And at one, some point in one of those two letters, there you are, uh, he, he told him to listen, but Timothy, I want you to preach in season and out of season. In other words, don't ever stop preaching the truth of God's word. And let me say this. Uh, and all of us need a mentor. And this is what Paul was, a mentor to uh, the young Timothy. And especially in, uh, uh, in the biblical, but it's also come to be true even on our workplace when we have a mentor, when we go and take on a job, who's going to take us under our wings and kind of show us the right way. And now, you know, there can be some bad mentors to tell you, well, I wouldn't do this and I wouldn't do this something negative about the company instead of mentoring uh, us in the right way. Okay. And, but the mentors are valuable. And even in some churches that they have this mentor programs going where uh, uh, of seniors is mentoring the younger people because there is such a generational gap there to many young people that don't get it and they uh, can, uh, what is it, benefit greatly from the knowledge and the wisdom of an older person. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let me say this too. Uh, there are people that come into our lives to be a blessing to us, uh, us be a blessing to the person. I know, and, and I don't want to keep talking about myself, but I'm just trying to give examples. I have been blessed by so many good friendships, 
and so many of the older mentors, uh, people that have mentored me in my life, mm -hmm. even just in life in general, and and a Christian in my church, you know, and I can reflect on so many of those older people, men and women, especially the women that took me under their wings when I was a young mother raising three boys and would take man to make sure I kept my children in church to be taught. But then those those younger, and then some of those mothers, some of those deaconess, and some served as both, but they were always providing godly, imparting godly wisdom and providing encouragement for that meant a whole lot. And we were talking, me and some others were talking. You rarely see that too much now in some of the churches. And that's a missing component in the church. And I, I uh, well, I knew about this lesson when I, because I've studied it so many times and taught it too, that mentoring is such a valuable commodity and it's in the church because Satan will get after folks in the church. Now he, because he feel that you, that's a, that's a permanent breeding ground for him to disrupt our walk with Christ. Okay, now, so as we start out in our lesson this morning, verses three through seven, and when Paul started out by thanking God for him to serve as he did, which he had learned from his forefathers. And he was pure conscious and without ceasing. And he said, I remember of thee in my prayers. He was talking to Timothy. I remember you in my prayers day and night. So that brings into uh, focus that when we pray, we should not just be selfish with our prayers. We are to pray for one another. Okay. okay. And because we know what prayer do. Prayer huh, is a mighty spiritual weapon that we have to fight against Satan and these uh, evil demonic days. And what I want, because uh, I listened to Dr. Stanley and he said something provided, something profound that has stayed with me ever since then. He said, he can fight any battle on his knees. Meaning that when he go to God in prayer, he has the upper hand because he's talking to the almighty God who is all powerful and he knows everything and he knows our heart when we come to him in prayer, in prayer and he certainly moves yeah. in our prayer when we come to him in, 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 uh, in prayer. Okay. And Paul was this. He was thanking God for opening his heart to the young, his young apprentice, Timothy. And that speaks to the love and us genuinely being concerned for the well-being of our fellow man. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so let me point this out really quick for a moment. Paul being writing and encouraging Timothy, his young protege, and who he was turning the reins over and have nurtured him and, 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 and ex, expanded and enhanced his already Christian knowledge from his, that he had received from his, his mother and grandparents. It talks about Paul's dedication to preaching Christ. Because remember now, Paul was in a Roman prison and he was getting up in age and getting toward the end of his, his, his life. And he's, he said, okay, Timothy, you have been calling into this. And so I'm going to continue to mentor you and preach Christ, regardless of if they come cut my head off in the morning. That's, mm -hmm. that's paraphrasing, but this is what he's saying, because he was showing his dedication to the Lord God. And, in front, and I can't give you the scripture verse, but Paul said this. He said, it is for God, for Christ I live. And for him, I will die. That speaks to his dedication to his calling and his commitment to continue to spread the gospel and proclaim the gospel of Christ wherever the Lord sent him. Because we know Paul established, it's been recorded, it's by seven churches throughout Asia and Asia Minor. And he traveled extensively. And, but he was not without uh, adversity 
you know, but he never gave up. He never uh, cried out, Lord, this is too hard for me. I can't do this. Why are you sending me here? He was not recorded anywhere. And I have studied Paul's life pretty extensively, but I said some more ago, but he, he said he never did. He just said he had a physical illness and he went to the Lord and asked him about it. And God told him, my grace is sufficient. In other words, you in this part, whatever's in your physical body, you go ahead on, I got your back. And he said, cause I'm gonna sustain you. And what my point is this and what he's, is that just is what God done for Paul. When we are dedicated to him and glorifying him and proclaiming the truth of his word, whatever condition we might be going through, we just know God is there with us. Mm -hmm. And he'll pick up the slackness. Okay, now what is missing? That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Uh, verses four and five. Well, Paul, it says this, verse Greatly designed to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. And verse 5 reads, when I call to remember the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwell first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee also. Okay. So what is he saying here is that Paul talked about his loneliness and his desire that's for, to see his uh, protege, the young Timothy, once again. But he had faith in, in him and Timothy that all of the Christian values that was instilled in uh, Timothy from his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice, that he would carry that on because that was the foundation what he had received early in his life and all that Paul have in, in, imparted or embedded uh, in Timothy, he will be able to carry. But then let me go and speak to their relationship once again. That's why he said he had those tears for um, uh, Timothy. I uh, was crying because uh, he was getting ready to leave his father in the ministry and go back to his home church and but there had been a time gap and, and don't hold me to this because I don't remember the time gap between Paul writing this letter to Timothy and when Timothy last saw him I have to research that a little further okay and that's why the toils were there if you ever been to visit a long lost friend that you haven't seen in a while and when you do see him there's hugs and some tears that will that that you one of the two of you, the both of you will will share. Mm -hmm. So this is what is happening here. And and I, I don't want to be sound uh repetitive, but it talks, it really speaks to the the, the strong but brotherly love between Paul and Timothy that they had developed over the years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Now. Now, let me say this. Also, I want to point out, and I've said it again, but I wanted to, that Paul was writing from a Roman prison. And we know back in those days, the Roman government was persecuting Christians during that day. And let me point out here, there is still Christian persecution taking place in some foreign countries. And I, I, I heard from a friend of mine from over there in China asking me to pray for them and their churches and different other Chinese providence where they don't have the freedom to sit and openly worship as we do today here in this country. And I keep ex, uh, saying, let's just don't take our freedom to worship away from us. Because when we take and look at some of the wicked folks in politics, they are trying to take everything. They are going against everything that is right and good that will help the people. Mm -hmm. And I often wonder, who is their God? And if they tell me they got one, I would want to worship him if it's going to cause me 
to hate my fellow man for just no good reason. That's right. Mm -mm. <laughs> so, and I, and I don't mean to be repetitive or trying to hammer that point, but I just want us to take and really appreciate the freedom that we have to worship. Mm -hmm. And if we look back at our history, at being, at being brought, our forepants being brought over here in slave ship, did we have the freedom to worship? I know over time that freedom came and we could openly worship and we, uh, oh, when I said we, we as uh, African American or Black American, uh, build, start building our own little churches so we could go and worship and have, would not have to be mingled in mm -hmm. with, with the, the other nationality. But my point is, we have come so far and we can worship and praise to God and freedom. Mm -hmm. And my heart goes out to many of those in those, uh, all those in those other countries who don't have, who do not have that freedom that we now enjoy. We should not take it lightly. Light. You're exactly right. We should not take that lightly at all. Because if we sit back and just say, well, that's the way it is. No, God wants us to worship him and worship him in spirit and in truth. And every opportunity that we can to go and worship him, we must take advantage of. Yeah, okay. Any other comments or questions? No, I was just, uh, Randy and I this morning had a similar conversation that we're having right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it just made me, you know, appreciate that he's listening to some of the things I say and I'm listening to him too. Well, um, yeah, you know, I haven't seen him nothing in a while. I got to send him the writing. I certainly do. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It won't be long. No. But anyway, and it's just good to have those conversations and sit down and and, and can talk it to uh, your children, and, and you just have that nice, friendly conversation. You know, families is important, very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, let me continue on with this. Uh, we see here in verse five, where Paul was talking about his upbringing, and, you know, and, and what I call it is his biblical, Timothy's biblical DNA because he started as a child with the teaching of his mother and his grandmother. And I'll say this, I, I, and I do believe this to my heart, and I've seen so many folks that have brought up in those Christian households, that how their lives uh, has been so impactful to the people around them. And, and I can't imagine me not being brought up in a Christian household. I really, I really can't because Amen. I, yeah, because I know, Vaughn, you and I is in that era to where on a Sunday morning, the first order of the day was getting ourselves ready to get to church. That's right. It wasn't no, oh, I don't feel like it. That was never, and I've often told my oldest son that there was never uh, a discussion of us not going to church on a Sunday, on mm -mm. a Sunday morning. That's right. Mm-mm. Get that up, get Got up getting ready. I got up getting ready. And our clothes was already ready. We didn't have to go mm -hmm. trying to iron this or do this. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They made sure. And I said, old lady Emma made sure that was one of my Saturday dues to make sure my clothes was ready for Sunday morning. I just want to say this. That brings back such a memory. Uh, when, when we were when we were little, mm -hmm. my my mother used to sew, and she made all our little dresses. Oh, okay. And on Saturday night, we washed our dresses mm -hmm. and hung them up Saturday afternoon and hung them on the line, let them dry. That's right. And make sure they was ironed before. Um, Sunday I know. That's right. I I know that's right, because see, she didn't even cook on a Sunday. She'd be busy in that kitchen making Sunday dinner. Dinner on Saturday. Saturday. That's right. And when we came from church, dinner all, was ready. It was, dinner was ready. She would eat mm -hmm. it, 
and we'd be getting out them church clothes and getting ready to sit down and eat. That's and right. dad always was at the head of the table. See, this brought about the family unity and mm -hmm. the structure. And even, and I know I've said this, I was taught the Bible by learning a different Bible verse to say grace with. Mm -hmm. You know, all these things are missing from our, our younger people's lives today. And then when they mm -hmm. look at me crazy, when I say, we have got to get back to the old ways. And I don't mean getting back to the horse and buggy, but I mean getting back to the family structure. Excuse me for a moment, Miss Mike. I gotta make sure this is not my girlfriend that's picking me up. Okay. All right. You have a blessed day now, okay? Okay. All right. And getting back to the family sitting down, eating together with the father at the head of the table and the children saying grace, or everybody saying grace, but the children had to learn a Bible verse before, and that's how we were taught the Bible. And yes, my parents wasn't as educated as I am today, but I tell you what, they not only knew the Bible, they lived the Bible, and they taught it to me in a way that I would forget it. And I could pass this on down to my children. But now, hey, it's all like every man for himself. And that is not of God, you know. Okay. So he can talk to, and the other thing that Paul was reminding Timothy that we he must be thankful that we as believers are chosen by God. And we he was called as Paul as we are to a holy calling and to bear fruit of the spirit and some of them are the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, meekness, and long suffering. And those are all attributes of God the Father. So let me just kind of move on into uh, the seventh verse. When Paul is still, is still encouraging Timothy as he was mentoring and talking to Timothy, that he said, listen, Timothy, verse seven. He said, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but one of power and of love and of a sound mind. So Paul is telling Timothy, listen, you don't have nothing to be afraid of when you're out there preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're going to have some uh, antagonists or those who oppose or is going to tell you that what you're teaching is, is not right. But when you stand on the truth of God's word, you will know that you are in, they say you are in the house because you're treating what's in the scripture. And don't be t intimidated by uh, what the naysayers say. Because listen, they, uh, the, the naysayers, tried to intimidate Jesus Christ when he was preaching. Mm -hmm. You know, he said, now, nah, you, God didn't give you that kind of spirit. He gave you one of power. You are powerful in his name because of the Holy Spirit who lives in every believer, gives us the strength the courage to go forward and our and our call. See, and then another point he wants to make here is that listen, just be thankful that God called you for this task. Because he could have called anybody. God calls who he wants to and he chooses. And that takes in a whole another subject of selection and predestined. God knows who he's gonna call before the beginning of time. He knows when we're gonna answer. He knows who is going to answer and know what we're going to do. See, that's the good thing about God, by being all known. Okay, so then he was telling him, Paul, Timothy, that, listen, when you're thankful for your being called into the ministry, and don't be afraid or be intimidated by uh the naysayers or the, all the opposition of the opposers, you just keep on preaching, keep on teaching. And he said, but now I want you to do it to the glory of God. See, all of what Paul is teaching Timothy is applicable to us today. We don't preach for self-grandizement. We don't teach for self-grandizement. We don't evangelize for self-grandizement. We don't sing for our own self. We sing and we usher whatever it is that we are doing 
We are doing it to glorify God because it's God who called us to give us that, that gift, uh, talent to use, that number one, to edify the body. That's number two. But they, one is to glorify him. Okay? And once, and I've seen this happen in so many, in some churches. It's all about position and what they is called perceived power. And that's not, that's not the wrong, that's the wrong attitude. Mm -hmm. And I can remember the late Dr. Ozzy Clark passed over that at my, where I came from, Northwest Union. He used to teach and he constantly reminded them there's no position. He used to tell them there's only two positions in the church, the pastor and the deacon. And whatever your service is, and not for you to be talking about you are powerful or this, because only God gives us the power to do what we do. And it's all about glorifying him. And making this church grow stronger spiritually and our service to him. Okay. Now, questions are coming. Well, it was a very good lesson. Mm -hmm. And just, just made me appreciate how I grew up, you know. Oh, I understand that. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Mm. Because it, it's instilled in me, and I don't know no other way. I don't want to know no other way. And right to this point, if I can say that I'm too old to try to learn. Oh, girl, I've been been too old. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even go. I beat my feet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I thank the Lord that I learned enough to know that, you know, he's still on the throne. That is right. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is Paul is bringing uh, this. This lesson is to Paul, but it's applicable to all of us, and whether today and tomorrow, and it should be as applicable back when our the younger generation behind us mm -hmm. to take this lesson and say, "This is how I'm supposed to live." And it's not about if I, if I'm not in the church, get in the church, Absolutely. and get in Christ. Okay, because the tr true church is in the hearts of every believer. And whatever I'm serving, it's not about me, the how good I can look to get praises from man, because man will praise you one day and he'd he dog you out the next day. He'd turn on you. Mm -hmm. but, and, but God is faithful and he's faithful in his love and all that he does for us. You know, and so he was giving, he, Paul was giving Timothy much encouragement because when you out there on this journey, of shepherding a shop flock of sheep, it's a job because it is, you're going to have everybody coming at you telling you how to pastor a church and never pastored one, <laughs> but they can tell you what you ought to do. And so he was giving him much positive encouragement, you know, uh, that it would make him successful and being the under shepherd of that local church. That's all pastors are, is the ownership of that local church and, and uh, of that respective local church. He said, now listen, the last encouragement he gave him on one of verses 8 through 12, and he tell him this, verse 8, be not thou for ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as a prisoner, but be thou partakers of the afflictions of the, of the gospel according to the power of God. What Paul is saying here right there, listen, you preach Christ and shout it from the highest mountaintops and you're going to suffer some affliction because he said, now look at me. I have suffered greatly and I'm here bound in prison for preaching Christ. He said, now I want you to, be, but know this, if it's God, if it's God's will to spare you that time, He will. You know, take it and look at him and his his partner Silas when they were together, when they was thrown in jail and for preaching Christ. They didn't go into this pity part and ask God, "Why me? Why did you do me do this? I'm just preaching, and here you got me." Through. What did they did was they had a midnight prayer meeting. This is what he's trying to impress upon Timothy. Yes, you're going to suffer some things, and not only just being a preacher, but Christians, when you're trying to walk right, upright, and live the life that you talk about, 
you're going to have suffer some uh, some persecution or affliction to be but he said don't be ashamed of it you just go right ahead on and keep doing and honoring your calling because he tells him in verse nine listen who have saved us it is God himself who called us and we have been called with the holy calling and he said now listen and it's you're saved for a reason to do God's work, not Timothy, not Willis, or not anybody, but to do God's work. And you're letting the light of Christ shine through in your works. He said, go right ahead on. And I want you to take this encouragement and adhere to my words as you have been, but and and go on forth. And and this when you have come upon those afflictions. Call upon the Lord. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, and he said, Now listen. And this is what he tells out in 12, verse 12. For which cause I am the apostle and a teacher. Well, I am, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have commanded unto this day. And let's verify what I had been saying to that Paul was telling Timothy, don't be ashamed of the gospel and be willing to suffer for preaching Christ. Okay, this is because uh, look at Christ. He did no wrong. He had no sin. He preached for three whole years and he came to earth as in human form for the sole fact of preaching the, the die for man's sin. But he preached the, and he demonstrated the power of God and what his message was about. Okay, and I'm closing with this. He told him, be able, not be able, wrong choice of word, be committed to preaching the truth of God's word. Anytime you are to preach, preach the truth of God's word, whether they're listening or they're not, you do what you have been called to do in this holy calling. Amen. And because it's the, the truth of God's word is what's going to get everybody saved who's going to listen and hear to the word. Now, I'm going to close with these points here. We as believers all have been called with the holy calling by God Himself, and we must keep be loyal to Him as He is faithful to us. Okay, when we needed a Savior, Christ came. The Holy Spirit takes a residence in us as our helper and providing for us. And my question was, how do we honor? Your holy calling is it with a trust in God and who's with us at all times? Or is it just a, to be taken as a sometime? I can do it when everything is going well. How do I stay committed and carrying it out the call when times get tough? Mm -hmm. When God is true to his word, he said, I'll never leave you, neither will I forsake you. So we must be faithful to God as he is to us. And that concludes the lesson. <laughs> close I with, just, yes, ma'am. Oh, go ahead. I, no, just, go, mm -hmm. I just wanted to tell you, um, you remember the, the lady, um, you went to a Christmas party with me? Yes. During the holidays. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she's been in and out of the hospital. Uh, last part of last year and some of this year and I didn't know it I just found out the other day I called her and she was telling me that because I had called her during the holidays and didn't get an answer and I thought that was strong I said I better check it. I just want you to put her on the prayer par 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 list her name is Jackie Nickerson and she's in the hospital Jackie Nickerson mm -hmm. okay. and uh the girl I used to call to see how she was doing because she used to cook her Sunday dinner and take it to her every Sunday. I just found out that she just found out she's waiting for a, tramp, for a lung transplant. Oh, Jesus. So 
spoke today in her life. Her name okay. is Donna uh, Lacey. Mm -hmm. Not, pardon me, not Donna Lacey. Uh, that's Donna is her friend. Um, her name is, um, mm, as well as I know what I can, I'll get back with you with her name. I can't okay. think of it. She's mm. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Let us close this prayer. Father God, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you for allowing us to bring the lesson. Father, my prayer is that it will resonate with all the hearers and renew our committed vows to proclaiming the truth of your word and living holy lives before you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Okay. okay.